right, good morning, church. Let's stand and praise God together. Sing it, I'll fly away. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. Welcome to McQueeny Baptist Church. It is so good to see you here this morning. Join it together to worship the Lord, and we pray that you will do that with all your heart. We're going to ask you to do something for us right now. We're going to ask you to take a moment to fill out the little connection card that you see in your bulletin. If you don't have a bulletin, if you hold your hand up, our ushers will bring you one. But we're going to give you a minute and a half right now just to fill this out, and then at the end of the service, we will give you further instructions about what to do with these. But uh, this gives us an opportunity to know who's in the service and a little bit about you. So uh, if you do that right now, members, visitors, everybody, thank you. Let's continue praising God together. Let's stand as we sing. to the crowd. 
precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Look away beyond the blue. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Look away beyond the blue. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. While he's calling you. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Oh, do remember me, do Lord. 
not Charlene. I want to read this this passage before Brenda and I sing. This is uh, speaking of Jesus in the synagogue. It's in Mark chapter 6, starts in verse 2. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach, and this is speaking of Jesus. He began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. Why is this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus was a carpenter, carpenter by trade, apprentice of an artisan, a craftsman he was made. People came from miles around, from far and distant lands, to be the first to see the work built by the master's hands. With his frame square and level, measurements true he takes what was broken make it better than brand new I'd travel back 2,000 years to his time if I could I'd love to see some other things that Jesus made from wood it makes perfect sense that when God sent a savior he would be a carpenter cause he knew what a working on we need of all his creation his greatest miracle he took two pieces of wood and saved my soul by the rain I was bound for the fire rotten to the grain then he picked me up and saved me like only Jesus could now he's molding me and shaping me the way he did with wood it makes perfect sense that when God sent a savior he would be a carpenter cause he knew what a working on we need of all his creation his greatest miracle he took two pieces of wood and saved my soul he took two pieces of wood and saved my soul Not too long ago, I shared a message with you about and talked about acceptance. And I used the illustration and talked about 
uh, going into my first pastor's meeting. As a young pastor, I just starting out, and how I felt really insecure when I walked into that room. I felt like, really, the question in my mind was, what are you doing here? Okay, you're really out of your league. I believe that all of us probably feel that way in some sense at some point in our lives, especially when it comes to uh, serving the Lord. I think sometimes we look around and we do, we make one of the big mistakes we make is we look around and we, we compare ourselves to other people. We look at the qualities somebody else has and we think, well, I could never measure up uh, to that. I could never be like that. Well, maybe you couldn't. I mean, maybe you couldn't be like that, but God has made you to be who you are. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit today, uh, but I want to kind of introduce what I'm doing, a series that I'm doing by saying that I'm going to try something that I've never done before, okay? I've never, never done this before, so I'm going to share it with you, and you can share with me what you think about it maybe later. But um, we're going to begin looking at some characters. Uh, the question is going to be, uh, who, is it, who is it that God uses? And can God use just a regular old ordinary person like you, like me? And so we're going to be looking at some characters in the Bible, and I've just kind of picked some that I, want to, that I believe exemplify uh, what I would call leadership and what I would call uh, the person who is totally devoted to God and, and displays that kind of leadership. So we're going to be looking at some characters, but here's what we're going to do. It's going to be a series of series. And we're going to start off today, we're going to be looking at the life of Moses, but we're going to be looking at it through a window of what were the qualities, what were the characteristics in his life that enabled God to be able to use him. And then I would like us to take those qualities and then look at ourselves. And then we're going we're gonna to do like four messages on Moses, talking about those qualities. And then we're going to move on to the next one. And I don't know how long exactly we're going to be doing this, but it's a good possibility this may take us all the way through Christmas. Okay? And so I uh, hope you'll be praying about that and praying for me as uh, I share the Word of God with you. We're going to start off this morning in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. It's where we find what is often called the roll call of faith, talking about those who have been faithful to the Lord. And Hebrews gives us that listing of people. And in that listing, we find uh, something written about Moses. So let's read what was written about Moses, and then over the next few weeks, we're going to break this down uh, in more detail. So let's begin in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. It says, By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw that he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. You remember what the king's edict was? The king's edict was that uh, all children, babies that are born... Uh, be put to death, all male babies, okay? And so that was, that was the edict they were talking about. In verse 24, it says, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward, by faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask God that you would use it to speak into our lives today. Lord, we want to be people that are used by you. And so, Lord, I pray that during this time together in today and the weeks ahead, Lord, that you would help us to, uh, to draw near to you and to know that we are able to be used if we're willing. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be looking, I think, Moses in his life. Uh, the title of the message, by the way, this morning is uh, Moses, Keys to Effective Living. I believe Moses was effective. I couldn't think of a better word than effect, effective. I believe that's what we want to be in life, isn't it? I want to be an effective parent. I want to be an effective husband. I want to be an effective pastor. And whatever it is that I'm doing in life, I want to be effective at it. And when you look at Moses, you ask the question, what, what caused him to be effective in his life? What was it that made him available to God so that God could use him? I believe Moses answered four basic questions in his life. And these four questions are going to form 
uh, the content of our sermons for the next four weeks. The first question he answered is this, the question of who am I? And then the second question was, what are my choices? And the third question is, what is really important? And then finally, what are my goals? We see all of these things right here in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 as Moses is being written about. And so what I want to do is break these down for us. The first, the first question is this, who am I? The key number one of the keys to effective living is this, be yourself. Be yourself. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 24 says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Notice he refused. So the first, number one, is refuse to be who you seem to be. Refuse to be who you seem to be. That is what I would call a false self. It's not the true person. It's, it's not who you really were designed to be. This is the false self. This is who you seem to be. Now, who did Moses seem to be when he got grown? Well, you know, he was, when he was a baby, his parents put him in that basket, put him out in the Nile. He was discovered, found by Pharaoh's daughter. He was raised in Pharaoh's court. He was raised to be a son of Pharaoh's daughter and thus a son of Pharaoh. And he had a great life in front of him. He had all of the benefits and all of the pluses of being an Egyptian leader, being Egyptian royalty. And yet it says that Moses, when he gr had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So there was a choice. There was a refusal. We all are in that same boat. Did you know that? Every, every single one of us had this identity that we think is true of, of ourselves. And I'm here today to declare to you and tell you by the word of God that you are not who you seem to be. You have the possibility of becoming who God created you to be. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22 says this, put off your old self. You see that? Put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through, the, through deceitful desires. What is he saying? What is the Apostle Paul saying to the Ephesians? He's saying that we are not designed to be who we seem to be. And we have to make a decision that we're going to take that off. Now, the, the imagery that's used here is kind of like the same wording that you would use to say that you put off uh, one set of garments and, and then put on another set. What is it to put off the old self? First of all, we have to recognize who the old self is. Let me just suggest to you that anything that you see in your life that is born of sin, anything that you see in your life that prevents you from becoming what God wanted you to be and doing what God wants you to do, anything in your life that prevents you from living into the design that God has for you, that is a false self. It's not true of you. God created us to be something more. Now, when we talk about who we are and the, and the idea that that is really the imagery or the, the picture of the sinfulness in our lives, we're all broken. You know what? Mo much of the sin in our lives, I've discovered, has come about, or the behavior, sinful behavior, has come about because we have believed something that is a lie. We have taken a path that God never intended for us to take. We have become somebody that God never intended us to be. Let me give you an example. Um, when, when we think about sinful behaviors, many times they start off sim simply as defenses. Uh, for instance, um, a young boy in school loves to be approved and accepted, right? No, we all want to be approved and accepted. That's a, that's a natural kind of inborn uh, tendency for every human being. When, when we're born, we want to be loved, we want to be accepted, we want to be approved. So uh, Johnny's growing up in, in elementary school, and he's struggling with mathematics, or he's struggling with English, or he's struggling with whatever, but he's having a problem, and he's not doing well. And he's certainly not getting the approval or the acceptance that he really wants. But then Johnny finds out something. He discovers that 
if he gets the answers before the test ahead of time, then he can succeed when he takes that test. And when he takes that test and gets an A instead of a C or a B instead of an F, he gets approved and he gets accepted. Now, we don't condone that, do we? Anybody in here? What do we call that? There's a word for it. It's cheating. I'm not going to even ask you to raise your hand this morning if you've ever cheated. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go there. But most of us at some point in our lives have taken the avenue of cheating because it's an easy way to get to where it is we want to be. You hear that? Cheating is an easy way to get to where it is we want to be. The problem with it is it robs us of everything we might have gained along the way to actually be the person that we want to be. And so what I'm saying is that it, it may seem kind of as a child, when a child is growing up, we may not see it as, as that significant. What happens when, a, when, a, when that child grows up to be a man? And suddenly he, he, he has learned and it's become his way of life, his way of being, that all through his life, he can, he can get what he's really wanting the easy way by lying and by cheating. And so it becomes a way of life. It becomes a practice. It becomes a habit. It becomes who you are. Now, we could, take, we could take innumerable examples to show us how that's true of our lives, okay? We could take innumerable examples. But what we have to do is take that thing in our life. Here's what I would suggest to you. What is it that you find, if you do a little self-examination, what is it in your life that, that it has, has kept you from drawing close to the Lord? What is it that's kept you from being the person that you really want to be? And then we look at that and we first of all have to say, okay, I, I first of all have to admit that that's true. You know, if we don't admit something's true, we'll never deal with it, will we? So we admit that that's true. We admit that we, we lie. We admit that we cheat. Uh, we admit that we do whatever it is that's, a, that's against the law and the will of God in our lives. We admit it, first of all. And then we have to stop denying it. In other words, we have to stop denying that it's true of me. Okay? We can't justify it. We can't act like it's not there. What do we do? We confess it. So the first thing we do in order to take off the old, I would... And we're going to talk about putting on the new in just a moment, but I'm kind of wondering, I wonder which is the most difficult in your life, trying to get rid of the old thing, the old person, trying to get rid of the old habits, get rid of the old ways of being, or putting on the new. Well, I don't know that I know the answer to that, but I do know this. We can't put on the new until we get off the old. Because if we don't, if we don't get rid of the old and just put on the new, all we're doing is glossing over. We're not really changing. I'm just curious, are there any ladies in here this morning? I'm not going to ask about men because some of you may also. Any of you ladies in here paint your fingernails? Raise your hands if you paint your fingernails. Okay, you got fingernail polish. How many of you, when you're going to take a new color, do you put it over the old color? Do you put it on the, just over the old? Is that what you do? What do you do first? You got to strip the old off. You got to get the old off first, yeah. I think that's, that's silly, taking off the old. I mean, we could just go ahead and brush over the new, right? By the way, I've got some woodwork in my house that has been painted so many times. And I promise you, I feel like the person that lived there before me that painted didn't even care that there was dust and, and fuzz on the, on the door facings because it was all just painted over and it just keeps building up. some point, you have to say, look, all I'm doing is glossing over the old. I've got to, no, the Bible says we have to take off the old. We have to remove the old before we can receive the new. So the first thing we do is we refuse to be who you, who you seem to be. You deny, you reject the old self. And by the way, you know... Mike, yes, okay. Just went off. I may have to have that in a moment. We hear a lot in our culture and world today about being yourself. I, I really should have actually started with this. Because the idea to be yourself, that can mean a lot of different things. In fact, in the world today, you can be applauded if, if a man... Something about this message is not wanting to be heard or not wanting to get out. A man today can decide, you know what, all of my life, I've really been attracted to, to other men, not to, to women. And so I'm just going to be 
true to myself. I'm just going to be who I'm supposed to be. And so I'm going to leave my wife, and I'm going to leave my three children, and I'm going to go pursue being myself. Never mind. Never mind the brokenness. Never mind the pain. Never mind the, the discomfort that you leave in your path. And you know what? That person, if I made that decision, if I, if I announced that this Sunday, I'm not. But if I did, if I did, I would be applauded. The, the world would applaud me as being the man that was, was finally willing to go and do what I really want to do and be the man that I really am instead of, okay? So in our society today, that gets applauded. So I'm not talking about that kind of being yourself. I'm not talking about a woman leaving her husband to go and find herself. If leaving your home and your family and being disobedient to the word of God is being yourself, then you've missed it somewhere. The self that we're talking about is not the world's image of who you think you are. In fact, that's the lie that's got us to where we are. What we're talking about is putting off the old self that is broken and damaged by sin. That's what Ephesians is talking about. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. And look at this. And is corrupt through deceitful desires. That's what we've been talking about. It is the desires that are misguided that lead us into the sinfulness that, that separates us from God. And so we have to take that off. And then second, we have to choose to be who God is created us to be. Choose to be who God created you to be. That would be your true self. That's the person that God really designed. That's the person that God created you to be. Now Hebrews 11.25 Hebrews 11.25 says he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of of sin. What did he choose? You notice there's a choice. See, he's, he's refused to be who the world said he was, and he has chosen to be who God made him to be, which is what? Along with the people of God, rather than enjoying the fleeting ple pleasures of sin. Moses chose to be mistreated along with the people of God. Why? Because he was a Hebrew. He was a child of God. So he refused to be called Pharaoh's daughter and chose rather to be who God created him to be. So there are, there's always a choice. You're never going to get to where God wants you to be if you don't make the right choices. There are choices to be made. Ephesians chapter 11, verse 23. Let's go back to that passage and continue on. Ephesians 11, 23 and 24. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. What are we doing? We're going to put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Do you see that? You see that? He's saying we're going to, we're going to choose to disrobe. We're going to take off the old, and then we're going to be renewed in the spirit of our minds and then we're going to put on the new self. Do you see that? Right in the scriptures, there's the old self and the new self, the false self and the true self. The person that the world has told you that you are, the person that you have come to believe that you are, or the person that God had create, has created you to be. Now, I'm going to give you an example out of my life on this one. Patience. How many of you in here would just, I mean, I really want to know, how many of you in here right now would just say, I am the most patient person? That's me. Patience is my, my, my virtue. Raise your hand. What? Okay, I've got one. I've got one. <laughs> it wasn't mine either, and it still isn't. But I will say this. When I was a younger man, I was wound up. Because I was so impatient. I was impatient about everything. And you say, well, is, is impatience really a sin? I think it is because I think impatience is a manifestation of pride. And pride says, it's my time that's most important. It's, it's what I want that's most important. And most of the things that we get impatient about are what other people are doing. I get impatient in traffic, right? 
I get impatient when my kids were growing up because they wouldn't do what I told them. They would put their stuff. I get impatient with my wife. I would get impatient with everybody, and I was living that way. And finally, it, it began to occur to me that this, this isn't everybody else's problem. It's not that if everybody else would just stop doing what they're doing, I would be fine. That's not the problem. The problem was me. And so I began to look in the Word of God and, you know, what does the Scriptures tell us and what's right? Ephesians chapter 4 again, verse, verse 2 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another. You notice that patience is opposed over against humility and gentleness. Do you see that? Humility and gentleness leads to patience. Anxiety and arrogance and pride and aggression leads to aggression, leads to impatience. That's what impatience is. It's a form of aggression. Now, I'm not saying that I've done this perfectly, but here's what I have done. I, I said, okay, this is the person that I, I, I have believed that I am. This is, and I've blamed everybody else. This is the person that I believe that I am. And this is what the Word of God says. To be completely humble and gentle, be patient, be patient, be patient. And so I had to come up with a different way of thinking. And I had to come up with, actually came up with kind of a statement. I, I came up with a, when every time I began to feel impatient, every time I felt that anxiety rising in me, I would just declare, the Word of God says that I am patient. The Word of God tells me that I was created to be patient. I will be patient. And I immediately changed. No. <laughs> in fact, in fact, I found that, uh, that you know, impatience has continued to plague, plague me uh, all of my life. Which brings me to point number three. Practice makes more perfect. That's not the saying, is it? It's usually practice makes perfect. Let me just tell you, you're not going to get there. You're not going to get there. Moses didn't get there. Moses, you know, even at the very end of his life, he, 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 he sought to be the man that God wanted him to be. Yet at the, toward the end of his life, because of his pride and because of his impatience, remember, we're not going to go through the whole story, but he struck a rock to bring water out of it when God had only told him to speak to the stone, speak to the rock. But he had struck the rock before and got water out of it. And now he says, no. so even Moses, toward the end of his life, still struggled, and so will you. We're not talking about perfection, but we are talking about being more perfect. We're talking about moving down that, that scale, moving toward, away from the person that you believe you are, moving toward the person that God says you are, moving down that scale. And all through my life, I've been seeking to do that. By the way, I've discovered along the way, I've discovered a number of other things besides patience that were a problem for me. Okay? But can I tell you that any, anything, the Word of God addresses all of the things that you're struggling with. The Word of God has something to say about every sin that you find to be a habit in your life. And the Bible tells us what we should be or what we could be. And I think it's important that we accept that, we believe it, we embrace it, and then we declare the truth over the life. And once we begin to do that, I think we'll begin to see change. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Romans chapter 12, great passage. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. In order to be able to test and approve God's will in your life, what needs to happen? We have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How does that happen? Well, first of all, we have to admit just need to admit the sinfulness in our life. I know it's not popular today to call sin, sin. But listen, I believe the Bible's clear. Any disobedience to the law, to the word of God, any disobedience to him is sin. It's brokenness. 
And unless we're willing and, and or able to confess that, acknowledge that, admit that we're sin. In other words, I had to admit that I was impatient and that impatience was a sinfulness, in my, a sinful behavior in my life. So I had to admit it. If I never admitted it, I would go on for the rest of my life, never changing. So we admit the truth, and then we confess our sin, we re- and we repent. That is, we recognize that it's wrong. We have to take it off. If it's good, I don't want to take it off. But if it's not, I need to take it off. I need to get impatience out of my life because it was affecting my relationship to everybody in my life, especially with my wife and my children, those that I loved the most. So I had to get it off. And the only way to do that is admit it and then confess it, repent of it, and then embrace the truth of God's word. Accept God's forgiveness, right? Just accept his forgiveness. And then find what the word of God says to give you, give you the, the strength and the power and the, the armaments that you need. What does the Bible say in Ephesians chapter 6? It talks about uh, the, the life and the, the spiritual warfare. Putting on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the God. We are told that God has given us the weapons of our war that we can defeat sin in our lives. And so we just confess it. We acknowledge it. We confess it. And then we seek God's help and forgiveness. And then we begin to press on one step at a time. See, for me, the impatience thing, it took, it took years, one step at a time, one day at a time, one irritability at a time, okay? And you know what? Listen, I still can remember having that feeling that, wow, I'm not there, but I'm, I'm so much better. You know, I'm not there yet, but I'm so much better. I'm not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I was. And I could see the results in my relationship with my wife and my children and my church. Now, I know some of you may be saying, I've seen you get pretty impatient a few times. I said more perfect, (laughs) not perfect. We'll never be perfect this side of heaven. But listen, there is hope. We can change. We can take off the old. We can put on the new. And we can be the person that God intended and created us to be. Not the false one that you are now. The true one. The true person that God created you to be. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness and your grace. Lord, I'm so thankful that though sin entered this world and by virtue of that, Lord, we're all sinners. We're all broken. We're all struggling. But Lord, I'm so thankful that in your divine plan, you sent forth your son into this world to take upon himself the consequences of our sin and brokenness. Lord, I pray this morning that we would just trust you, confess our sins before the world and acknowledge they're true and then change us, Lord. We pray this prayer today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you stand with me as we go into this time of invitation today? I don't know what God may be saying to you right now. You know, you may be, you know, you may have a mental list already starting to tick off of, oh my gosh, I've got all these. It's okay. You take one day, one step, one decision, one choice at a time. And this morning, the greatest choice that you can make, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you will never have any idea. You will never be clear on who you really are supposed to be in this world unless you know Jesus. And if you've not trusted him, this morning is your time right now. The invitation is open to you. I'm here to pray with anybody that may have a need. And this is your time. The altar is also open if you just need to come and bow down and pray. Whatever it is that you need to do, now is the time as we worship together. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as
Amen. You may be seated. Uh, just a couple of things uh, real quickly this morning. First of all, sometimes you ever, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but right in the middle of my, my prayer at the end of my sermon, I prayed something that right off my spirit said, wait a minute, that's not right. Let me tell you what it was. I prayed uh, that, that Jesus was sent to take the consequences of our sin. He came to... Uh, he came to satisfy the righteousness and the justice of God. But i got to tell you something. The consequences of our sin are usually on us. Okay? He, he, will take, he, he took upon himself the guilt of our sin. And he made us righteous with, with God. But the sins in our life, many times we're going to have to deal with those consequences. Just want to make that clear. Also, uh, just want to remind you that uh, every this is uh, Bluegrass Sunday. We do bluegrass music first and third Sundays of, of every month. So glad that you're here today to enjoy that. Uh, now I'm going to ask you to do something on, for I'm me. Gonna, I want to just address really quickly. Sure. So you notice we didn't have pianos, keyboard, or drums. This is like true blue, bluegrass, right, Brenda? <laughs> and so we're going to throw in like a true bluegrass service every now and again. So this is our first. Okay. Right, see, right, and, and there you go. And with the theme of today, we don't want any false bluegrass. We want true bluegrass. Take off the old, put on the new, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, now this is totally getting out of hand. So, uh, and so I want to ask you if you would, uh, first thing, if you would pass the, uh, the little connection cards that you filled out earlier, would you pass those to the center aisle? I knew you probably put them in your Bible or tucked in your shirt pocket or something, but take them out and just pass them down. Boy's going to pick those up. We appreciate it so much. really helps us know uh, there's places for your prayer requests, comments on the back. It helps us a lot knowing, keeping up with what's going on with the people in our church. And it also is great when we have new people come, and, and we are so glad that you joined us here today. Just a few announcements this morning. First of all, we have a kids ministry, children's ministry leadership meeting this afternoon at 5 o'clock in the fellowship hall. So if you work with, if you work with our children, Awanas, uh, Sunday school, uh, preschool, I mean, anybody that works with our, our children, you're invited to come at 5 o'clock. A lot of things coming up. You know, we're nearing the end of summer and heading for the fall, and so we've got a lot of things we need to talk about. Also, a church council meeting. We did have a church council meeting, I think, scheduled for the 14th. We're moving that to the uh, August the 21st, but we'll be announcing that further in the month as we go. Church council meeting was moved. Finally, um, last but not least, newcomers class. Having a newcomers class on August the 17th, that's next, no, that's, uh, next Wednesday. Yes, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday uh, evening uh, at, uh, right here in the church in the fellowship hall. And I don't know what time I put on that. 7 o'clock. Thank you. So if, you haven't, if you're interested in knowing more about McQueenie Baptist Church, we want you to have the information that you need in order to, to make an informed decision about church membership, if this is where God wants you to be. And so that's what newcomer's class is. It's, about a, it's an hour and a half long. I teach the class, and it's a good chance for me to get to know you a little better and, and you to get to know me. I'm not sure that's going to be necessarily positive for, uh, for the church, but nonetheless, that's what happens. And I'd love to have you come. There's a place to sign up at the information table. That way we can know how many are going to be in the class. And so please sign up. Let us know that you'll be in the newcomers class, okay? All right. I think that's all of our announcements today. And once again, I want to say thank you. How, how, what a pleasure it is to have you worshiping with us. Because uh, this, this is one really great and awesome, amazing church. And all by God's grace, right? Yeah. 
So we're glad that you came and joined us here today. Let's all stand together as we are uh, prepared to dismiss this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your grace. Lord, be with us as we leave here today. Go our separate ways. Lord, as we go into Sunday school time, uh, Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless and, and fill us with your Holy Spirit and your, your presence. And Lord, we do pray that you would help us just to grow to be the people that you truly designed us and created us to be. We pray that we would have that true identity that comes from Jesus Christ, being more and more like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here.